Hi guys, Rod from Bensonium Thought Videos here. And I must confess, I have fallen behind on my relativity series. But while I work on my calculus videos, I thought that the current news cycle relating to the climate chaos that is now all around us is worth a video. So I'm going to do a very 21st century thing here and put two trigger warnings at the beginning of this video. The first trigger warning is if you're struggling with life at the moment and looking for videos to cheer you up, then I strongly suggest that you let this one pass you by. Unfortunately, the first part of this video contains utterly black news, and it is from this darkness that I drift into my second trigger warning, and that is Christianity. The problem is that when one begins thinking about issues where the outlook is one of certain catastrophe, you can no longer ignore the God question as we shall see as I unfold the logic of this video. We must tackle the God question face on, as obviously the question of God's existence has a major bearing on the ultimate outcome of what we are about to experience. In some ways, it is a bit like a person who has been diagnosed with glioblastoma. Their prognosis is utterly bleak. They are almost certainly facing death within a period of under five years, and so the question of ultimate reality at this point must confront them and they must, I guess, come to peace with whatever view they take in relation to the God question. So if you really hate thinking about religion or things to do with religion, then also let this video pass you by. Right, so without further ado, let us begin. It seems glaringly obvious now that the scenarios that scientists warned about in the early noughties in relation to climate change are now well and truly upon us, and things at this point are only going to get worse. There is no point pretending otherwise, and even to do so is being dishonest and disingenuous to the younger generation that will face the full consequences of runaway global heating. One of the debating points, I guess, that has always surrounded this difficult topic is just how bad it will get. I guess 20 years ago, there was some hope on two fronts. Firstly, that the climate models of the time were making predictions that were overly pessimistic. And secondly, that the warnings that were being made by the scientific community back in the early 90s and early noughties would be heeded by the world governments and that we would make heroic efforts to decarbonise our economy. The harsh truth is that all hope in preventing catastrophic global heating is pretty much exhausted, as the above considerations on which it was built have vanished. It is clear from the current climate chaos, which we are experiencing right now, and have done for most of the 21st century, that climate change predictions were, if anything, underestimating just how bad things were going to get. With the recent intense heat wave in Canada and the USA, which of course resulted in the all too common forest fires and the death of many marine creatures because the coastal waters became so warm, the record breaking temperatures in Antarctica, the extensive flooding in Germany and China, and now the very intense heat wave sweeping over Europe, it is clear that we are in deep, deep trouble. There is even a report that the Amazon rainforest has now become a net CO2 emitter due to the intense deforestation that is currently occurring. Of course, all the climate outliers of 2021 are no longer outliers. We only have to go back to 2019 to witness the apocalyptic scale of bushfires that ravished Australia. All these data demonstrate that the climate model predictions of increasing CO2 concentrations from the pre-industrial levels of 278 parts per million to the now 417 parts per million were correct. The problem is stark. We have now set off a whole cascade of positive feedback loops which will only accelerate the increasing concentrations of CO2 in our atmosphere and this will further exacerbate global heating, moving our planet further and further away from the Goldilocks zone that is compatible with supporting more than the 7.5 billion of us that now share this fragile home. The harsh truth that we now need to face head on is that we are not 
as a species even going to begin to make the changes that are necessary to even stop the chaos at its current point. Even if by some miracle we could reduce our carbon emissions to zero by tomorrow, we are still not even sure how bad things are going to get with the current levels of CO2 we have ejected into the atmosphere. To put it bluntly, all the capacitive systems of the Earth have been used up. We have already warmed the oceans, melted vast swathes of the Arctic and Antarctic, and the dangerous thaw of the permafrost has begun. All this will continue even if we could magically prevent our own anthropogenic carbon emissions, which of course is now impossible. Yet, there is one other sour data point we can add to our dark future prediction, and that is the spectacular failure of humanity to deal with a much more tractable problem, and that was a worldwide viral pandemic of a pathogen that was thankfully not particularly lethal, around 2.3% in the worst performing countries like the UK, but was contagious enough that if it was allowed to become widely established, would prove very difficult to correct. So in terms of COVID-19, very few nations got their response correct in the very initial phase of the viral spread, despite the fact that the epidemiology of how to address the contagion like COVID-19 was well established. The initial problem was simply that the future threat of what might happen in relation to COVID-19 could not be properly evaluated against the immediate damaging effects of closing down economies to stop the first infection wave of the virus. In many ways, this scenario is very much like that of global warming models in the 1990s and early noughties. The science was telling us that we could be in trouble in the near future, However, given it was the future and any immediate actions to address the future were based on predictions that carry a degree of uncertainty, no government was willing to disrupt the business as usual model of Western consumerism because the resultant financial loss caused by a share market restructure would be political suicide for any government that attempted it. This is especially so given that the major influences of public opinion are media organs owned by individuals who have grown extremely wealthy on the back of the economic model that enshrines the concept of exponential growth of public listed companies. Of course, from a first principle perspective of mathematics, the idea that a company can keep increasing its profits by a percentage of its size indefinitely is equivalent in the long term to infinite growth. Infinite growth is not compatible with a planet that has only a finite set of resources, even if that planet has as much resource as our Earth. Yet as the COVID-19 pandemic unfolded, another uncomfortable truth has been observed, which also sadly has a strong parallel in relation to the climate disaster we are currently facing. The issue is that even when the world is blessed with strong visionary leaders, who are willing to see the data for what it is and to try and mandate the necessary action to correct the problem, the overall response of humanity to any particular challenge is only as good as the weakest link in the chain, so to speak. In terms of COVID-19, after the first wave, we did see some good leadership rising in several nations around the world. Leadership that took the science seriously and was willing to bring in the necessary measures to control the spread of the virus, even if such measures damage their economies in the short term. Yet amongst these appropriate responses were plenty of nations that had leaders who either did not have the wit or the necessary moral fibre and leadership qualities to enact the policies that science was demanding to address the spread of COVID-19. Even traditionally prominent nations like the USA and UK were completely defeated by COVID-19 because of terrible leaders who embraced the false dichotomy that it was either the virus or the economy rather than understanding that controlling the virus would ultimately protect the economy in the long term, whereas allowing COVID-19 to get out of control would cause much more long-term economic disruption than the short-term hit the economy would take from measures that were designed to bring the contagion under control. 
Now, the harsh truth is that the terrible leadership exercised in relation to controlling COVID-19 in nations like India and the UK means that the number of potential mutagenic events for COVID-19 to generate a more pathological variant has been greatly increased, which is why it is not that surprising that the major source of the two significantly more transmissible variants of COVID-19, the Kent and Delta variants, originated in the UK and India respectively. These variants, once present, tend to infect nations even with more restrictions in place, meaning that nations that have stuck closely to the measures that are effective at bringing the COVID-19 pandemic to an end are still suffering the consequences of an active worldwide pandemic because of the bad responses of nations like India and the UK. What is even more frightening is when leaders are in charge who refuse to learn from their mistakes but continue to adopt policies which they know failed previously but which they enact purely to make their political lives more comfortable. As Boris Johnson has done with so-called Freedom Day on July the 19th of this year. Such irresponsible actions mean that COVID-19 will continue to cause havoc on a worldwide scale simply because it is not technically possible to coordinate the nations of the world to act in a way that will ensure the pandemic comes to an end. As some epidemiologists have pointed out, Johnson's government's latest experiment of releasing all restrictions in the midst of a clear exponential infection rate, which is now similar to what it was at the peak of the second wave in the UK, and allowing the virus to mass infect the population in the presence of a semi-vaccinated society is a clear evolutionary recipe for increasing the chances that a new UK variant might arise which is much more resistant to the current vaccines because one is experimentally applying a heavy selection pressure via Johnson's insane COVID-19 policy on the virus to develop a vaccine escape mutation. In relation to global heating, we see a similar problem at play, with terrible leaders like Bolsonaro allowing the Amazon rainforest to be rapidly degraded, perhaps one of the most important carbon fixing life forms on the planet. So given that we are now living in a time of runaway global heating, and as a species, we have clearly demonstrated our incapacity to deal with the crisis we now face. What awaits us? Well, this is where we cannot do the normal 21st century thing of avoiding the God question. Because whether our universe is overseen by an entity that made it, or whether our universe and ourselves are purely a product of natural processes, has a major bearing on the ultimate destination of our climate catastrophe. So we shall start by assuming atheism is correct. If there is truly no God, then the outcome for humanity is very bleak indeed. Basically, we are facing at best a mass extinction event as the carrying capacity of the planet collapses, resulting in the starvation of billions of people and other creatures. Now at this point, some might protest and state surely even the worst predictions of global heating do not mean that life on Earth will become impossible. Thankfully, this critique is most likely correct. However, the issue is what happens when over 7.5 billion people on the planet start to experience the full consequence of environmental collapse and subsequent food shortages. It doesn't take much imagination and understanding of human nature to realise that the result will be massive human conflict on a global scale. Given we have armed ourselves to the extreme and that we still possess enough nuclear weapons to annihilate every living human being on the face of the planet and cause permanent nuclear winter means the normal answer that is used to resolve what is known as the Fermi paradox might indeed be correct. For those of you who have not heard about the Fermi paradox, it is the idea that given our universe is so stupidly large and packed full of stars and planets, if intelligent life has evolved on Earth without any external intelligent input, then even if such an event is extremely unlikely, the sheer number of Earth-like planets that should be present in our universe and the universe's immense age 
should mean that intelligent life has evolved perhaps many times somewhere else in our cosmos. Now if this is the case, and we assume that this life would follow a similar trajectory of technology advancement as our own species, then it is surprising that we have never detected any signal anywhere in our universe that has the hallmarks of being generated by aliens who possess the power to communicate. One resolution of this paradox is simply that intelligent life forms always end up destroying themselves before they can either exit their planet via space travel or generate enough communication technologies to send out some form of a signal because their own technological advances end up destroying the carrying capacity of their own planet or else they destroy each other in some form of armed conflict. Now perhaps the answer to the Fermi paradox is way too anthropomorphic in that an alien species may not contain as many foolish specimens as seems to inhabit our own planet. However, whether the paradox is fantasy or not, certainly the data we have from our own species is that we are closely following a very likely path to either near extinction or at least a large reduction of humanity and most other species. If you are someone who doesn't mind considering the likely scenario that awaits us, I have put a link to a video by Roger Hallam, the founder of Extinction Rebellion, which is well worth taking the time to watch. Okay, so this is the atheist scenario. Does the possibility that there is a God that made our universe offer us any hope? Well, yes, of course it must. But before we start to explore our current climate crisis, in the context of a theistic view of reality, I probably should first address the all too common objections that prevent many 21st century Westerners from even entertaining the idea that there could exist another reality that is not directly observable and so invisible to our scientific methodology. To start in the heartland of atheist thinking, Richard Dawkins, in the middle of his tirade against theism in his book The God Delusion, admits that there is a real possibility that our reality could in fact be inside some fantastic alien supercomputer where we are just part of a computer simulation. Indeed, many thoroughly modern physicists who would I guess describe themselves as atheist or agnostic are open to the simulation idea on the basis that our universe is governed by complex laws which are fully compatible with the language of mathematics. The advances in both AI and virtual world simulations opens, at least in principle, the possibility of a future self-awareness or multiple self-aware entities being contained inside some form of computer software architecture. Now I personally am not interested in debating the possible validity of such an idea, as I have no vested interest or need to reduce our phenomenological consciousness to something that would meet what is known as the Turing test. My own epistemological understanding of the strange reality in which we find ourselves is not dependent on human personhood being completely reducible to a complex algorithm. However, what I can categorically state is that the idea that our universe might be contained inside another system is very, very close to a theistic ontology, even if atheists don't like to admit it. In fact, the only difference I can see between general theism and this fairly trendy idea that has popped up in modern physics is that the physics version assumes that whatever it was that created our universe simulation is itself something which must ultimately not be a product of intelligent design because atheism insists that there is no ultimate intelligence that has existed outside of space-time for all eternity. What is fascinating however is that if we stay for a moment strictly within the alien virtual world idea we do not need to introduce any theism to get the same conclusion that if our universe is the product of an outside agency, then that agency can, if it wants to, override the overall program that is in operation and so interrupt the normal causal events which makes up our data set that gives rise to our modern understanding of how our reality operates. 
the only extra step required to get to full-blown theism from here is to state that the ultimate first cause of reality was itself not created and so has existed for all eternity. Now again, whether you are an atheist or a theist, our reality has components in it that appear to be eternal. Probably the most obvious examples are the architecture of logic itself and the language of mathematics. I guess an existentialist might argue that enumeration can only exist if there are conscious beings to comprehend it. However, this is very much a faith position. One thing that is absolutely certain is that a transcendental number like E has only one value in any base and is always an irrational number that results in an exponential function that is unchanged by the operation of differentiation. In this sense, we discover such a phenomenon, so certainly one can be forgiven for being a doubter in the idea that we have created such an entity, because it definitely exists apart from a conscious mind, even if it requires a conscious mind to first discover and perceive it. When all is said and done, the only philosophical difference between theism and atheism is atheism claims that the set of entities which are eternal exclude consciousness, whereas theism claims consciousness, and more particularly personhood, also belong inside the eternal category. Once this point is fully appreciated, it also becomes obvious why the question of who created God is foolish, because it is committing a simple category error in the same way as if someone asks who created rather than who discovered the number E. Yet the theism we have just arrived at using philosophy does not tell us anything about the character of our universe's creator. And this, I guess, is where the many world religions compete as a possible communication from the author of our universe. In relation to the world religions, we can make some general statements if we now allow ourselves to entertain theism. Firstly, they could all be false. Or second, one of them could truly originate from the universe's author, while the others do not. Now, this second possibility requires a little more precision, because if one assumes that there was one true revelation, then while the others might represent revelations that did not originate from God, the amount of truth they contain can be directly measured by comparing their claims against the revelation one has decided is the genuine article, so to speak. For me, I believe that Christianity presents the most coherent and correspondent explanation of the reality in which we find ourselves and the human condition. Note my use of the words correspondent and coherent here. These two tests are what the ancient Greeks established were necessary to determine if a statement was indeed true, and they also constitute the test used by the scientific method to judge the validity of a scientific theory. I have already covered these tests in my earlier videos and have put a link to them in the description below. Now, I obviously cannot go into detail for why I have concluded that the content of the Christian Bible most likely represents a true communication from our universe's maker, but certainly the fact that Christianity spans a progressive and logically coherent revelation over 2,000 years, which culminates in a single person who claims to be God incarnate on a rescue mission to save humanity from its propensity to do evil, for me, is actually the best and most likely explanation of our world with all its beauty and suffering, and of humans with all our complexity, especially in relation to our dual abilities to do great good and great evil. So, if for a moment we entertain the Christian worldview, and we take seriously the content of the Christian revelation, we discover a God who created our reality and who populated that creation with beings that were in his image in the sense that they were relational and moral agents with free will. Likewise, we also discover that just as this God was the first cause of our universe and all its operations, so he also defines and orders how relationships between conscious moral beings should operate, thus defining the landscape of good and evil. 
Once such a landscape is defined, it logically follows that beings with free will may choose to rebel against that moral landscape and so enter the logical category of evil. Now the Christian revelation makes it quite clear what the consequences of such actions will look like in the sense that the Bible clearly defines and delineates what evil is and what its consequences are. Similarly, when one compares this to what we experience, the Christian explanation nicely explains and even predicts the human condition. Yet the revelation also goes a step further in that it makes claims about the ultimate destination of the universe in terms of what the maker of our reality intends to do about the current situation in which we all find ourselves. The good news, which is literally what the word gospel means, is that God is determined to correct the evil that is now present in our common experience and remake creation so that it is in complete harmony with a perfect human existence. Again, perfection here is a word whose definition is logically determined by the universe's author, since only he can assign actual purpose to why the universe exists in the first place. The classic why question, which is forever outside the reach of the scientific method. So, does the Christian worldview suddenly make everything okay again? Well, sadly, no. In fact, while it guarantees that the ultimate future of our planet is not one of utter destruction, but rather glorious renewal, the Bible makes it crystal clear that the path to get to that point is full of pain and suffering. In fact, when one looks at the apocalyptic literature of the Bible, the time before Jesus returns to renew heaven and earth appears to be full of chaos on both a human and environmental level. Now, of course, the book of Revelation, which is one of the books in the Bible, is not meant to be taken literally, but rather offers, in very pictorial and graphic language, the suffering humanity faces due to its own folly and as a result of God's judgment, which many theologians see as hard-coded into reality, in the sense that we reap what we sow. In other words, if as an individual I drink and smoke heavily, then I will likely develop bodily illnesses related to these actions. If as a species we degrade the carrying capacity of the planet, then we shall reap the consequences. Certainly, it is at least a little tempting when looking at the picture language of the book of Revelation to consider verses such as Revelation 16.8 that state the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun and the sun was allowed to scorch people with fire as a potential forewarning of a time when our planet's temperature would reach a level that was no longer ideal for mammalian life. Therefore, while theism might give us some hope that ultimately things will not end in disaster for all eternity, neither atheism nor theism appear to give us much immediate hope to the current climate threat we now face. Also, some atheists will perhaps understandably accuse theists of using the idea that God will ultimately sort it all out to justify not taking the necessary action to correct climate change. While it is true that certain expressions of Christianity can lead to the abrogation of personal responsibility due to the non-biblical form of fatalism, as I have discussed at the beginning of this video, the failure of our species to adequately address global heating has nothing to do with whether folk believe or disbelieve in God, because in order to address global heating properly, the world would have to be populated by exceptional leaders in every nation, all working towards a single goal of decarbonizing the economy, despite the economic cost. Sadly, this was never going to happen, no matter what individuals personally believe about the God question. So where does all this thinking leave us practically? Well, if you're an atheist, I suggest you watch the Extinction Rebellion video by Roger Hallam as he is a much stronger believer in the power of organised protest to get governments to change course. While I personally don't think such actions will work, obviously we should all at least be making it our personal agenda to put climate change at the very top of our priorities of things we want our governments to act on. 
Similarly, if this video is ever watched by anyone who knows high net worth individuals, encourage them to think about investing in science that aims to decarbonize our economy. One bugbear of mine is that the billionaire class appear to be obsessed with a new space race. Also, way too many people stupidly think that if we trash the Earth, there will be another planet in another solar system that we can just colonize. The harsh truth is that trying to preserve the Earth's biosphere, which admittedly is a very difficult challenge, is a much more tractable problem than flying to another planet that is outside of our solar system, and so therefore many light years distance from here. Alternatively, if you are a theist, well there is one more thing that is open to you, and that is to pray to God for mercy. Interestingly, this can also apply no matter what religion you belong to. I have been developing my argument from a Christian perspective, but of course the one truth that pretty much all religions recognize is that the maker of our reality has the authority to set the moral rules that we should follow. Certainly part of that rule set includes looking after the planet he has given us. So it is clear that our actions over the last hundred years means that we are all guilty of failing to do that. Now certainly from a Christian perspective, there is a very strong message that God is very ready to forgive people if they are willing to admit they have messed up and repent of their failures. In the Old Testament, this even applied to whole nations where God would relent of some judgment he was warning he was about to enact because the people repented of their sins. One worrying thing about atheism is that by its own framework, it makes corporate repentance to a higher authority impossible because if you believe that such an authority does not exist, then of course it makes no sense for you to say sorry to it at a more global level. However, if God does exist and he is like the Christian God, then there is real hope that a true corporate repentance from our greed and consumerism might elicit a merciful response from God, whereby we as a species are spared the worst effects of global heating. Now, if at this point you are thinking, but that is physically impossible, you are missing the philosophical implications of theism. If it makes it any easier for you, think about it in terms of an alien computer simulation idea that we looked at earlier. In this scenario, clearly the imaginary alien could easily tweak the code to break any predicted causality which we had come to expect. Such an event would appear to us as a miracle. One such event for the Christian is the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth from the dead. Yet really, it is just that the author of our reality has introduced new input into the system independent of its own algorithmic operation. So if you are a Christian, the other indirect response to global warming is to continue to, as it says in the book of Thessalonians, live a quiet, good life, mind your own business, and as it says in 1 Peter chapter 3, be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have so that others might become theists capable of exercising a form of global repentance. Obviously praying that God might open people's hearts to the Christian gospel is also part of this practical strategy. Okay, so that is it for this week. I realize this has been a confronting video, so it is a bit odd to ask you all to like it. However, if you did find it helpful, please do hit the like key, and if you want to see more of my content, then please do subscribe to my channel by hitting the subscribe button and the bell notification key below. Until next time, I hope your body and mind are in a good place, and bye for now.